Oh my God. That's oh. All right, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Amy Weishart. I'm the director here at the library, and we're really pleased to welcome uh, Corinne Spitfire and Leslie Seiden for a poetry reading tonight. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction of them both, and I wanted to mention to you that they both have books available for sale and signing after, after the talk um, or after the reading, and we'll, we should have a few minutes for questions at the end as well. Uh, so we'll start tonight with Wesley S. She is a poet and musician who lives in Seal Cove. Her poems have appeared in several anthologies and literary magazines. Her column, Permanently From Away, appeared regularly in Face Magazine for two years. Uh, she was awarded the Martin Dibner Fellowship in Poetry in 2002. Uh, and her first full-length book, The Fool Sings, was published by Rain Chain Press in 2014. Why don't we? I'll do an introduction for. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. Uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of Gemini's in the room, so thank you all for making the room seem twice as full. <laughs> really helpful. Um, I have been. Uh, been working a lot on, on two uh, separate lines of work, so you'll hear a little of each today. Mostly you'll hear um, a lot of the stuff I've been working on is about life along my road, about 102. And 102, as many of you know, is a road that goes through many, many, many different transformations, and the people who live there uh, are very interesting and there are little places where nobody knows anybody and places where nobody wants to know anybody. So, but I love it there. So I've been reading a lot about that. But I'm going to start with something from the book just so that I can hold it up and show it to you. Um, I write a lot about the weather. And so I thought since we've been having this fog, I would read a poem about fog, which is called Fog. This morning, I cannot see the garden from the porch. I try to remember the rose, squash, beans, carrots, dill. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can remember your face. What I see is a picture, you standing in the roadway, waving, looking elsewhere. If I walk, I can push back the fog. Porch to fence, fence to woodpile, wood to garden. Is there a path to your face? Finger to forearm, forearm to shoulder, shoulder to neck. I am not sure. I'm not sure I can find what is knowable by way of what is known. This morning, I cannot see the porch from the garden. So what I brought with me from, from both manuscripts that I'm working on are uh, spring and summer poems, mostly. Uh, there are a few quite depressing ones in here, but the autumn winter ones were really sad and I just decided I couldn't face them. So this one is called April Afternoon. A skateboarder takes the sharp curve with the confidence of 14 years. His body is his friend today, gliding in the open over the asphalt around the curves that hone his power. This is his road, eyes sharp and balance rooted, hat backwards to keep his vision clear. He lives here around potholes, wary of soft shoulders, ears focused on cars and kids behind him. He knows his road. He knows it will be taken away again when summer comes. His arms are tight against his torso, jacket zipped, summer so far in the future. And this is May. They're not entirely in order, but 
I had more patients in the beginning of the selection. So the first group was very much in spring dance. May light dripping pink, bird song, seaweed, taste of salt, early drive, easy drive, car and road in a giddy dance, a waltz, I think, as the curves curve back, soft shoulders held up in a way like the hem of a formal gown. Road and car and I alone for now, sun bouncing off the side mirror, buds pulsing on the hill above the lake, electrifying the woods. Leftover frost heaves bounce us along, a long straight stretch demands a tango. I can taste the rose in my teeth. And this has been a spectacular year for lilacs. And this was written a few years ago when we had another very cold June, and it was also a spectacular time for lilacs. Lilacs have bloomed. It is cold even for Maine, and the lilacs seem to like it. Panticles drop icy dew as heavy buds droop everywhere along the road. In the house, the lilacs are almost lost on a table piled with books and unpaid bills, coffee cups, cutlery, an empty salad bowl, all sit like supplicants beneath the huge vase. As I sit, guilty and irritated, shoving the mess aside to get closer for a sniff, I grab a sweater which is soft and warm and droops across my bare feet as I pull them under. Uh, I often write poems that are uh, part fiction or at least conflated. I think that most poets do. It's easier that way, but this unfortunately, uh, all of the details in it are uh, very sadly exactly how it happened. It's called That One Year. The crash site where the teens died is still adorned with flowers and ribbons. No such markers on the others from that year. The funky cottage where the guy shot himself while the EMT he went to high school with pleaded to just let him help. The barn where they discovered our neighbor's body in a vat of fiberglass where her husband put it after he killed her or maybe before. The fancy old house where a toddler strangled in the cords of the window blinds. The string of misery hijacked the road. At the market, we shivered as we whispered about it, were afraid to ask each other who we actually knew, tried to joke about curses and exorcisms. I just wanted to drive with my eyes shut. I spend a lot of time looking out my window, which probably doesn't surprise anybody who lives in Maine and has a window. <laughs> but I do, and I have my, my bird feeders are hung right where I can see them, and I can actually sit on the steps and watch through the window the, the feeders. So this is called Hummingbird. I hear the hummingbird as I weed by the feeders, feel the force of his wings percussing the air. The seconds when our tasks coexist, his necessary, mine only seeming so, swell with portent, with dreams of flight. I hope for a glimpse as he flies away, the wonder of his red throat, the marvel of his sighs. Listen until his sound is merged with the rustling of the woods. And the other side of the bird watching. It is never only a pretty picture. In first light, I thought the stump of an apple branch was a small hawk ready to eat the chickadee eating sunflower seeds on the damp ground below. Relief and disappointment knit together as the sun rose. It would have been hard to see the chickadee swooped up. It would have been glorious to see a hawk so near. It's called 9.30 p.m.
p.m. July, a long time ago. The right amount of warm for Maine, soft smell of night ocean everywhere, stars and fireflies, bats and mosquitoes, quiet accented by the occasional car or night bird, air breathing for us as we sit on the front steps, taking it all in. We are still visitors, living the life we long for in the city winter. Our neighbors are for daytime, except tonight when shouts leap the road full of venom and misery. We don't know how old they are, newlywed, is he a threat, is she? Should we do something? We are on our feet, out where we can see them in the middle of the road, faces twisted and streaked with tears. They are stuck in it, stuck in the road in the anger and the misery. From another house, another voice. Shut the F up, it's the middle of the night. And it's over. Fizzing out like cheap fireworks on the empty road. <laughs> <laughs> They're still our neighbors and they're lovely. <laughs> uh, this is a poem that is based on a true story that was told to me by an old lady who is a very, very good friend of mine. And uh, she didn't actually say it happened to her, but I have a feeling it did. It's called Fresh Catch. The fish man was on the corner every Wednesday and Saturday in front of his truck in clean old pants that looked too small, holding up fillets of cod and haddock for inspection, holding out change. Fresh cats, pure thoughts, hard work, he liked to say, which made us laugh until the day he slipped his arm around Mary, who was picking up some clams to steam for her grandkids like she always did on Saturdays if the weather was okay slipped his arm a little too far down her back and offered her the chance to have a bit of play with a man young enough to be her son, if she could catch his drift. She told him to keep the change and walked off with her clams. <laughs> Work and fish and pure thoughts, he muttered, as if he couldn't believe there was one that got away. Yeah. So yeah, she, as I said, she never said it happened to her, but I think it was her. And I can just hear her saying, keep the change. Oh, this one is called Dark Sky. We are arguing about finding the telephone. We are pretending the argument is about finding the phone. We are pretending it is not an argument. It is not a good time. The storm outside has left us in the dark. That was an hour ago and the sky is clear. Candles are lit and old transistor radio works. Music slows us down. We didn't really need the phone. A dark sky, warm air, flashlights, bug dope, stars, stars, stars. We could walk the Milky Way. One jump, we could dive into the cove and bring up armloads of stars. So I write a lot about the sky and I'm quite enamored of space and pictures from NASA and all of those things. And uh, these are two about that. This one is called, I see the baby universe on my iPad. Space holds all the evidence, we are taught that now. If ever it shone, it shines still. My mother envisioned all sound remaining, pulsing in the air, lingering in the vacuum. They might find us if they are out there by our drifting words or songs, or if not find us, know us. So be careful when you speak. I heard a commentator say, wow, the universe has gotten older, as if the universe was his distant cousin's kid come to visit <laughs> on college break. How else to think? All our relations, all our words are stardust out there waiting to be called to a witness box or back to the table. Now the baby universe first exploding into beingness is captured by telescopes and dialogue with computers generating images with discrete edges color-coded to evoke spectrum. A universe 
the size of an egg shines from a machine the size of a sandwich. It stares up at me and I back at it, amazed. And this one is called James Wegg Takes Flight. Uh, I had sent this around quite a bit in the anticipation of James Webb. And I, I was one of the, the many, many people who watched James Webb actually take off and sort of unfold or the, whatever it was, the graphic realization of it unfolding. Um, and it finally got accepted and it was published the day that it took off which I didn't know they knew was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to happen. So it was, yeah, that was very exciting. Anyway, um, in it, I refer to our local universe, uh, which is a phrase I learned uh, from reading Carlo Rovelli, if anybody knows his work. Uh, he writes a lot about science and, and about uh, astrophysics and uh, in a way that a person like me can understand. And so this... Uh, he refers to the local universe, meaning that which we know about. Not just that which we can see, but that which we know about. Implying, of course, that there are other universes that we don't know about. So that's where that phrase comes from. James Webb takes flight. Our local universe grows. The unknown becomes a destination. The destination becomes an event with consequence unknown. We seek the proof that what we want to know is worthy. Our local universe has peopled our imaginings with beings unlike us, and now we need to know the what, if not the who. We hope we are not alone. We hope we are. <laughs> So the, the other theme of, that has been taking up a lot of my time, of course, is growing older. So I'm gonna to start to mix some of those things in at this point. Um, this one has kind of come from the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it has a lot to do with growing older, but perhaps not directly. It's one of those poems where I don't know where it came from. And I certainly don't know where it's going. Fairy tales. Then the children out to forage. Tell them, be careful of the witch, the wolf, the white rose, the unknown, which is everything beyond the door yard. Tell them, be careful of coming back empty handed, of coming back smug, of thinking the gate is ever really latched. It's called garden, garden monologue. There are, of course, a lot of garden poems. In the garden, grateful for a rare emptiness, lost in the blue of borage, in the darkness that nurtures the carrot, in the green between blossom and ripe, your voice calls across the barrier of death to ask me how I'm doing. It's easier now to be honest and too late to be afraid of losing you. Not bad, I start. Keeping on is what I did best, do best, you always said. I found love again, some hardships, some delights. I play a bit of guitar and I write still, sometimes about you. I'm surprised to find you in the garden. We struggled over writing and the garden when they took time away from you. It got easier after a long while. There were years when I stared at the blank page the way I stared at the bedroom door, expecting it to fill with you, afraid it would only ever fill with you. This is called Death Waits. A crow was building a nest in a tall spruce down the block, and I longed to open the window and fly. The mountain I saw from the hospital was close enough to tempt me. The mystery I was reading was awful, not much better than the crossword I couldn't finish. Both had clues answered by death, and I have had enough of that. Death was here, waiting. 
I was rude. Death, expecting no less, ignored me, pulled up a chair. When your eyes cleared and you looked past me, we saw death leaving. Down the block, an arriving crow passed a bouquet of withered grass to its mate. The mountain stood. I opened the window. This is called a list of things. Pine cones are catching the sunrise. Bright copper against the dull green spruce. This first day of spring, 19 degrees. Calm, tied out, mud flats like ice, holds winter close. The window closest to the bird feeder is fogged by coffee steam, cat breath. Relentless inhale, careful exhale. I'm getting used to being alone. I'm becoming comfortable with quiet. The lie that follows me each morning says I am not rehearsing for widowhood. On the phone, your voice is strong, determined. The hospital food is good. The care is good. You miss me. I miss him. I whisper to the birds and the cat and the pine cones far above. My heartbeats are loud at night. I think about the list of things I may or may not do to ready the house for your return. And I'm going to finish up just with two more. It's called Night Voice. In the night, a voice and not a voice is droning. This empty dream space has no dimensions, no here, no there, no me, no not me. It is the privilege of dreams to be nowhere and no one. And once awake, I crave that privilege to know all and tell nothing, to say nothing and tell all. The voice and not voice follows the waking into working, into dinner, into the book I hoped would swallow me, into a sleep that waits to hear. And this last one is called Grief Responds to My Complaint. Uh, I, I rail a lot. I rail at my poor husband. I rail at the radio. And I spent quite a bit of time railing at grief. Uh, and I, I expect to be doing that again. You know, as is completely common at my age to have a lot of grief to rail about. So this one is called Grief Responds to My Complaint. Mm -hmm. Grief would like to remind you that it has no obligation to look at your calendar or check the time in your zone. <laughs> Secondly, grief would like to remind you it does not maintain a schedule and you cannot request one. Further, grief would like to state that it has infinite patience and can wait forever. You can pretend it's not there, but that is costly and exhausting. Lastly, grief would like to remind you that it is the portal. There is nowhere you can go now without going through. Thank you. Thank you very much, beautiful poems. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce Corinne. Um, Corinne Spitfire is the author most recently of The Body in Late Stage Capitalism. She's also the author of Standing with Trees and a chapbook entitled Wild Caught. Uh, she won national first place in the 2019 Joe Gouveia Outermost Poetry Contest. Uh, she was also the Poet Laureate of Belfast, Maine in 2007 and 2008. Her poems explore climate change, racism, and violence against women. Hello, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, I shake, so I'm gonna read the poem that describes that. <laughs> Residue. Essential tremor is commonly described as an action tremor. I shake, left hand mostly. It makes some people nervous. 
Sometimes I am nervous. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes my whole body shakes. There is no myth of a daughter killing her father. My nerves and muscles cannot resolve the simultaneous impulse to never reach out to him again or to cut his juggler. He's now dead of his own accord. I shake the death rattle and sing freedom. So, um, I love this poem. So I like to start with ones I love. Some of them I don't love. <laughs> When we were not ubiquitous, we moved on the savanna in rainforest, desert, tundra, steppes, among rhino, grizzly, jaguar, and yak. Rice numbered 40,000 varieties, jungle and alpine medicinals, unclassified bounty. We rode, sailed, paddled, ocean, inlet, ice flow, bay, with cod, whale, seal. 200 species of herring schooled, Arctic tundra and temperate prairie, uncultivated forage. We traveled ribbony cycles from yarrow, bamboo shoots, berry, fig, to fish run, bird migration, deer yard. Tree, grass, chaparral, moss conversed in continuous unmolested root plexus, enzyme clouds, rhinestones, trails, and scat puffs. We wove, potted, embroidered, sleeves, saddles, medicine bags, pounded and plied empanada, ravioli, pierogi, dumpling, wind, rain, snow, high elevation, sea level, vegetation, fauna, molded our muscles and song. Before God claimed the word, unpronounceable, unspeakable, before men called the word father, oh ma, dripped from our lips. Love was an action and that hasn't changed. So I'd like to acknowledge that we live in unceded Wabanaki territory. And um, every time I make a land acknowledgement, I ask myself to do something about it instead of just making the announcement. And um, one of the things you can do is go online to Wabanaki Alliance and find out the legislation that's before our Senate and Repub and um, before the legislature to, um, there's several bills that are really important. And of course, one is the bill that is um, to recognize Wabanaki sovereignty, Wabanaki tribe sovereignty, and um, our governor is against it and has stood in the way of it passing several times. So do what you can. This poem is called Liquidation and I've been reading it since 19, 2016. For 36 years, I've lived on some shore of Penobscot Bay, paddled the east and west branches of the Penobscot River, transverse Penobscot County to get to Medway, Lincoln, the Golden Road, visit the Penobscot Marine Museum, Penobscot Theater Company, read the Penobscot Pilot, smell the Penobscot Potato Factory, wake up to the weather on the bay. Penobscot River watershed covers 8,750 square miles from Bucksport to the Canadian main border, extends with an easy portage to the Allagash, into the St. John, all the way to New Brunswick, or over to the Kennebec and down to Popham and the Bay. From the Bay, you can get anywhere, Scudic, Monhegan. I know a few of the carrying places, can read the water some, Nowhere I might find wild berries, sight eagles, great blue heron, 
from Castine to Isle of Ho, Brooklyn to Campton Hills, Belfast to Mount Desert. Know where I might go swimming, McGonagall, Pemaquid, Naskeg, names I've learned to say the settler's way, but none we've appropriated it like Penobscot, a mispronunciation of the people's name for themselves, the river, the land, Panawapskia, meaning the river, the land, the people. Here for at least 13,000 years, 90% annihilated by incoming immigrant germs, the remaining estimate of 10,000 and 1,700 fought with the colonialist in the revolution, now number somewhere around 2,000. Cut down by genocidal scalp bounties, war, alcohol, child abduction. The Penobscot treated into 22 square acres of their homeland, a swath of the river and its islands from Medway to Old Town. Now the state that dubs itself Maine claims this stretch, the river, does not include the water. Panawapskia, land, Panawapskia, river, Panawapskia, people. I'm a big dreamer. I've had to live, my dreams have saved my life many, many times um, since I was a child. So here's a really fun one. Grange Hall dream. One, meeting over, go up to sleep on the top floor of the Grange Hall. Old four poster breast bed, saggy springs in the middle of the cavernous space. White linens, duvet, nightgown, lit from above. The rest remains dim, foggy, grayish. Two, I dream wolf comes and climbs in with me. Jaguar arrives, takes the other side. Occasionally, Jaguar rises, circles around the room, returns. Three, I wake, go downstairs, am greeted by two men to whom I relay the dream. They power up a YouTube clip showing the whole thing gone viral. Four, I wake up in my own bed. <laughs> I'll give you an Okay. This one is a dream also. So you know how dreams are one way and then they switch completely. So there's a big switch in here. So just pretend you're dreaming. Advice on the game. Setting up the dining room in the old Western Lodge for the competition, big wigs game of hearts. Each swaggers into the closed and dimly lit room wanting to check the new deck for the queen of spades. At three, I go to the kitchen, ask to take a break. I wanna call my mother and make sure I get a ride home. Climbing straight up to the sky on a tall metal ladder, deeply planted in the open ocean. At the top, on a platform, a woman dressed in black commands me into a suspended bathtub. Releasing the tub, she says, be the bitch. <laughs> you look dreams like that way, you know? <laughs> uh, let's see. No. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this poem I wrote when um, the group of women at Bowdoin College were raising money for Rawa, 
which is a revolutionary association of Afghani women. And um, it's called Libretto for Mina. And Mina was the um, founder of the Revolutionary Asso Association of Afghani Women in 1978, 77, like something like that. So at the same time we were having our women's movement, they were having one too. And one of the things they do besides many things they do, but one of the things they do is teach women to read and write. So this poem's about that. Excuse me. Libretto for Mina. I have learned to make these scratch marks match the sounds of the voices all around. I have learned to connect one mark to the next to make words of the sounds of my people all around. I've learned to piece together the abstracted construction of table, recipe, photosynthesis, compiled into theories of relativity, divinity, the oppression of women. I've spent hours in wondrous magic falling into someone's imagination, finding a corner in the house to escape or a hammock to relax, expand, travel. Because I can read, I have been to Hafez, Rumi, Anne Frank, Elie Wiesel, Pablo Neruda. I've been to the Good Earth, Geisha Land, Doris Lessing. I've been to more worlds than any astronomer, solved more mysteries than Scotland Yard, had more discussions in feminist theory than Harvard. I've learned to shape these scratches, hatches, and assembly grocery lists, kitchen table notes, letters to the editor, master's thesis. I've learned to enjoy the effort of plucking ephemeral precognizance from my belly and turning it into verse. Somewhere between learning these marks for the King's English and the wax tip scratches of Basanki, the unbroken symbolic tradition of my forebears, somewhere between these schemes of communicating meaning, the facts exist. An Afghani poet, Nadia Anjaman, was beaten to death by her husband, the poetry in her voice too much for him. And when I slithered out from under the weight of my father's body and rifle, I could already read and write. Somewhere between cave painting and universal literacy, the facts exist. The authentic voice of any woman can be sucked into a black hole by the fisted scripture of male hubris or fed inflammatory morsels of raging freedom because some sister somewhere has learned to speak her truth and acts on it. Where'd it go? <laughs> All right, I'll use the table of contents. That always, that always works. That's why you have one. <laughs> um, give you a break. Summer is our lover. Summer is our lover. Light kissing early dawns, insistent chants of birds, banquet of pinks chasing us to bed, heat drenching sweat into the water, into the water, into the water, walk, stroke, ride, language, edge of land sea, hammock naps between birches, tides purring, mud slurping, Paddle wind, po polishing skin. Pluck, dive, roll, float, adoring the nubby coastal spine and the inland troughs. Pemaquid, McCumman Quick, Aline, Curtis Cove, Flanders Bay, Third Machias Lake. Enough dry sticks 
to spark flames melody and kick up overtone colors, loons reaching territorial crescendos and yowling coyotes milky ways, penetrating dreams. Suck into pores, pull, gather, expand to Idaho, Lubeck, Sisticos, straw, blue, black, rasp, elderberries, staining the teeth, tomato, corn, swallowing fire. What time is it? Okay. So um, I had a brother who had Down, Down syndrome and he was, um, as they say, put away when he was 10 and I was seven. Keeping a bird, one, clip the wings, cut the outer feathers, full grown and bloodless. Nicking the budding can be fatal. Do not cut the powerful plumes that spread. Even a flightless bird can glide. Two, it was one of those times when you could only read the directions for the first part, how to put your son away, how to go to probate court, what to tell the tr judge. The truth, of course, neighbors ostracizing, special school closing, what they said when he was a baby, better for the other children. Not the whole truth. Like one of you, the husband, refuses to be seen in public with his son. It's enough to take your child to the barracks, leave him for a month, no home stays, one short visit halfway. Even the young withdraw in two weeks. That was plenty, no further instructions, what to do for yourself for your other children, people who you might talk to. There was none of that. Three, your first son descends into the empty seat at the kitchen table. Your daughter's focal cords squawk, odd contortions. Coyote. Other wild ones visit. You live in my throat, howling, no lying down with dogs. Other wild ones visit. You live in my throat, howling, no lying down with dogs. Other wild ones visit. You live in my throat, howling, no lying down with dogs. I'm going to read two more. Um, white, blues, and reds. Blue, so blue. Blue like those songs wrapped up and tied around each other. Melody and rhythm hammering out. Love's a fickle and contemptuous thing. Have those got no bloody blues for so long? Not like a telltale bit of slip, but like the elastics completely worn and done around my ankles blues. These daily bread blues. Nothing like my blue with the world blue. Have the dodging blues, flurry doing blues, oscillating and brawling with the stultifying low down, done in by the litany of bloodletting, water polluting, earth drilling, soul sucking, Extortionists are winning blues. These I'm alive, white, seeing red blues. And ever grateful that the sky blue and the sea blue and the blue of blue that makes green, orange, red, yellow leaves shout the beauty and the glory of blue, that that blue of the world is bigger than blue me. These I'm alive and white seeing blues has me working something, something screeching, 
something hot, red hot feverish, taking the fish knife to little white lies, slashing blank white sheets, excising white structum, tearing up red carpets, kneading, scratching, clawing at white gone snow blind, something where my blues aren't staring into bare white canvas and my reds, my reds are dismantling the white elephant and lining up to testify, obliging a world full of color, a world full of color. I rail. <laughs> If I were God, if I were God, I would come to you quietly in the practice way of Mohawks. I'd stand right next to you, right next to you, like an oak, like your beloved dog, like a barnacle. I would wait for you to inhale me, and we would exhale the whole world. If I were God, I'd stand next to you until you knew yourself as me. Then, like a mother, whisper, clean up your room, and you would do it. Thank you. <laughs> you have questions? Questions? Anyone got any questions? Can you come up with a question after we hearing that stuff? <laughs> okay. Good. What? Um, he, uh, they closed the institutions. Uh, the big institutions and he got into a group home and the group home people he got in with were completely lovely and he stayed with that group home until he died and when he was at dying in hospice three of the people who he worked with came and bathed and took care of him and i'm happy to say that he and my big brother and i all made it out into a good life. So he made it out into a good life too. Blue? Blue? Yeah. What about him? <laughs> um, how to figure out how to um, own being white in this world and um, talk about it in a way that's not um, in a way that makes sense to me. You're welcome. Let's, let's say you want to come up here too. I, I liked blue for that reason because um, sometimes I do try to imagine if we all were just colors, mm -hmm. like all the colors. Good. Can I say that? Thank you for blue. Did that help with? No. No, that was perfect. <laughs> but you're welcome down. <laughs> To get it together to get a manuscript out before I forget how to do that. That's hard work. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>